So first of all, thank you for putting this thing together here and inviting me. <clears throat> Once upon a time, things were clear. At least it seemed so, and at least when it came to defining what materialism and idealism meant. One can, for example, think of a quite cliché, yet in this version classical definition of these terms that you will find in pretty much all traditional textbooks, the shitty ones, at least. Idealism, idealism is the name for the position that starts from, assumption, from the assumption that it is consciousness which fundamentally determines social, historical, and or material being, including one's own. Materialism is the name for the position that assumes that any of those kinds of being determines one's consciousness. When we are, in a very little, uh, literal way, determinately, determinately move from consciousness to being, we are in idealism. Consciousness is idealistically the determining instance, and what is determined is that which is not consciousness. Being is then defined as that which is not consciousness, not conscious, that is to say as the negation of that which is the actively determining instant, instance in the setting. We are in materialism when we reverse this picture. Here there is something, namely historical, material, social, political circumstances, practices, whatever may be included into the concept of being, a concept that entails all that which did not originate in consciousness, but, and maybe precisely therefore, has an impact on the latter. What both positions in this abstract and highly trivialized version of their opposition share is that both establish a constellation, or more precisely, a relation between two terms. These two terms can be rendered as being in consciousness, being in thinking, nature and spirit, or depending, even form and matter, if you wish. It is important to see that both materialism and idealism in this delineation, delineation assume that all there is is being in consciousness, nature and spirit. There is nothing else, not even nothing, as it were, or if there is nothing, it is either something that originates in spirit or consciousness or in matter. In this way, both materialism and idealism make the identical, the same assumption about all there is. And they also both assume that there is a constitutive difference between consciousness and being. One is taken to be the negation of the other. Being is that which is not consciousness and vice versa. This is why the specificity of either position emerges when and as soon and only if one moves from the assumption that there is being and consciousness to an account of the end between the two. Materialism and idealism are in this reduced classical uh, distinction two ways of articulating a determinate and determining relationship between two terms that are both considered to be given and that exhaust all there is. There is being and there is consciousness and materialism and idealism determine the end between the two differently. Yet, what ultimately and conceptually marks their difference is the prevalence of one term over the other within the setting that they share. The difference between materialism and idealism in this picture is a difference of emphasis. Either it lies on being or on consciousness. There is to say, th this is to say that they thereby take one of the two terms to be the dominant term, the other one thereby becomes the subordinate. Materialism and idealism differ by means of the determination of determination. They differ because they differently determine what determines what. One can then, in consequence, see that one can easily unfold a multiplicity of different versions of materialism as well as of idealism by offering different classifications and determinations of how to conceive of the dominance of the one term over the other. It can be that the dominant term has a completely determining dominance over the other, such that the other becomes simply a medium of its expression, and so that there is a one-to-one -one translation of cause and effect. If this is rendered drastically, this de determination of the determining impact that one term has over the other then may lead to a revision of what materialism and idealism had in common in the first place. For if there is a complete determination, say, of consciousness over being, of spirit over nature, then it might very well be that there is no being and no nature uh, that does not or itself originate in consciousness or spirit. That's, for example, Hegel's claim. In a way, it's more complicated. So the radical idealist and materialist claims that there is ultimately only one term, 
Idealism and materialism in such a version are philosophies or theories that assume that finally and ultimately there is only a one of consciousness, spirit, being or nature. Even if idealists and materialists assert that there is being and consciousness, spirit and nature, as soon as they also assert that there is a complete and full determinant, uh, determining impact of one over the other, these positions ultimately have to revise their prior claim, for ultimately there is only one term and the other is uh, turned into being a mere semblance of otherness. With this move, also the relation between the two terms is weirdly internalized or cancelled out, such that one can claim that there is only consciousness, yet it generates being out of itself as it has to make a difference, or that there is only being or matter, yet it posits a difference within itself. But there is also the option that the dominant term does not have a completely determinately determining uh, effect or impact on the other. Rather, this impact is restricted and limited, for example, by the very constitution of the other. There is then a determinate limit to the effect of the determination the dominant term can have over the other. That is to say, there are two kinds of determinations, and one that is taken to be the rather active part is not able to gain dominance entirely. An idea may then, for example, not be able to transform being or matter in, in a way that it is completely realized in its other, but only up to a certain extent. There may be a determinant and determining dominance of one over the other, but there is then also some resistance of the subordinate term. In this way, the materialist and idealist still uphold that there are two being in consciousness, nature and spirit, yet they can only account for this two-ness by assuming that there is one thing that links the two terms in question. And what links them is the very medium by means of which one tries to determine their relationship, namely determination. One has to assume that one cannot have a full determining impact over the other because there is a determinate repercussion, a resistance, that also has to be artic articulated in terms of determination. One term does not have a full and complete determining impact because the other also comes with a determination of its own that stands against the determination of its other. Even if this version of either a materialist or idealist, uh, of a materialist or idealist position starts to claim that there are two terms involved, it ultimately also dissolves the two into another one, namely into the one of the very medium in which the influence and impact of one over the other is taking place. The ultimate semblance seems to be that there is either a materialism or an idealism that entails an account of two terms involved. So it's short of, let's say, shitty recon deconstruction that I just presented, right, of the cliché picture or image of, the, of the idealism and materialism that both seem to suppose two terms, but there ultimately is always only one. It is a matter of emphasis what kind of consolation one gets of this with regard to the history of philosophy. One can easily construct the opposition of Aristotle as the good materialist <clears throat> because he ultimately claims that everything depends on the realm of historical concrete practices in which different forms of normative commitments take place and realize themselves and that their setting varies, varies depending on their particular effects that already had uh, the, the, on the particular effects that they already had on consciousness. And in this picture, Plato would be the bad guy who seems to assert the logical priority of the realm of the ideas <clears throat> And that would be the arc-idealist move. This is the version classical materialist of the Marxist version often opted for, which is why you find in classical textbook almost always, just like, let's say, from the Marxist era, um, almost always Aristotle framed as one of the good first materialist philosophers, <clears throat> just think of Ernst Bloch or people like that, which point to an unwilling alliance of that kind of rendering, alliance of the former Marxist regimes with uh, surprisingly contemporary American pragmatism, both weirdly ignoring, I find, that Aristotle still defended slave ownership in cosmological terms even and had no problem with the complete absence of women from the political commonwealth. Yet, one can easily construe the opposite version by emphasizing that in Aristotle there is no matter independent of form, and it is thus matter which cries out for being formed inter alia by social and human practices. Thus, matter becomes a simple medium of expression of a form that determines what will matter and what matter will be. And one can easily construe a materialist version of Plato, emphasizing that his whole teaching originated in the discursive practice of Socrates, 
and hence there is a determinant impact of language, for example, on what one can and is able to think. One has played these games a lot. Also opposing Hobbes and Rousseau, Kant and Hegel, Hegel and Marx, Marx and Marx, the early and the late, Marx and Lenin, Lenin and Stalin, whoever you like. Alain Badiou diagnoses a peculiar reversal of the struggle between materialism and idealism that according to the Marxist thinker Louis Althusser will forever determine philosophical thought. The reversal consists in a particular materialist maneuver. What he calls democratic materialism did perform an astonishing operation, namely it internalized what seemed to make materialism into materialism and idealism into idealism. Contemporary materialism in this rendering, but use rendering, asserts that what there is are bodies and languages. What divided materialism and idealism now becomes a part of a reformulated materialist position. Thereby it, asserts for, thereby, it asserts two things at once. It states that there is a being, a bodily and historically specific being, that determines consciousness. Yet it also asserts that the very medium of expression of thought and consciousness, namely language, must be grasped in precisely those terms. So contemporary materialism is what in logics is called paraconsistent. It asserts that the classical Aristotelian principle of the excluded middle does not hold any longer, but it asserts that the principle of contradiction holds. So it basically says, yes, there is being and it determines consciousness, and there is consciousness and it determines being. Right? It's having, like, having the cake and eating it. This is to say we encounter a position that presents itself to be, as um, uh, to be materialist by stating that there is no contradiction in asserting that there are bodies and languages, being and consciousness, nature and spirit. Finally, we seem to have included two into the setting. But this is all there is. There is a bodily nature and a spirit articulated in language, yet this is all there is and because this, uh, and here lies the catch, all this is what is material in one way or the other. It is bodily and language related. This is it. There is nothing except that. So weirdly, there is another reign of the one, if you want to want to want to call it like that. Immanuel Kant, and I, I use the diagnosis that he gives in his uh, critique of pure reason here to show a certain filiation that I would like to emphasize of that kind of materialism. Immanuel Kant presents at the very beginning of his first critique, uh, the critique of pure reason in 70, uh, 1781, an interesting diagnosis. In his preface, Kant talks about a peculiar phenomenon that he calls indifference. After diagnosing that reason is molested, he literally uses uh, in German the term belestigen, by questions it itself cannot answer, for they exceed the capacity of reason. Reason works such that it constantly encounters its own incapacity. In reason, there is a compulsion to bring up questions which it itself is unable to answer, and precisely by being unable to stop its insatiable thirst. It's like a child, Adorno once remarked, constantly asking why this and why that and why, why, why. Thereby, Reason is driven beyond the realm of phenomena, as Kant states, and it reaches what he calls the kingdom of principles. Yet it is in this very kingdom where a similar thing happened that is diagnosed by Badiou concerning the status of our cont contemporary belief system. For in this kingdom, kingdom, the realm that previously had been called metaphysics, there are no criteria by means of which reason could validate its own answers to the questions that brought it, that brought it there. It was led somewhere where there is nothing but disorientation, it seems. So one just starts to assume and declare. This is Kant's picture. This is the reason for Kant, namely uh, the fundamental lack of normativity, so to speak, why metaphysics became a field of struggle and Kampfplatz. Reason in its conduct exceeds any kind of normativity and thus disables any kind of what Habermas and many of uh, his contemporary followers uh, would call the normative transcendental groundwork of normativity. Now, on this battleground, on the battleground that is and became of metaphysics, can see several positions emerging. There are first and foremost the dogmatics. They try to reign despotically, that's Kant, for if there is no normative framework, 
anymore. Any prejudice, any conviction can work and be presented as a legitimate judgment. I can just claim whatever, right? I mean, that's Kant's point, and people did that a lot. There is only a law that is defended. Uh, they only know, that's Kant, law and violence without freedom, as Kant will later define dogmatism. There is only a law that is defended with a rhetorical kind of violence without any kind of place for the freedom of people agreeing, disagreeing, judging for themselves. But because this does not generate the dominance of one dogmatic position of the, of the other, but just an infinitization of the struggle itself, constantly new dogmatic positions emerge, all these dogmatic positions logically appear on the same level, and they struggle. Yet this kind of battle generates, again, this is Kant, a form of anarchy. Anarchy is for Kant, as he later defines it, I quote, law and freedom without violence. This might seem surprising, yet in anarchy for Kant, there is a permanent struggle between different dogmatisms, freely declaring and claiming whatsoever, none of which can unfold the power or violence of being the only game in town. And it is this endless kind of badly infinite struggle, to speak Hegelian here, that brings about another position, namely the skeptics. Skepticism names for Kant a position that takes a distance to that which one, as he defined reason, reason cannot distance itself from, right, from the questions that it itself brought up and that brought it to the realm of metaphysics. So skepticism is a way of stating that all uh, the dogmatisms and all the struggle of dogmatism is in the end not really worth it. But the problem with skepticism for Kant is it claims this in a dogmatic manner. Right? The skeptic becomes a closet dogmatic in one way or the other, saying that metaphysics doesn't matter. For, what, for them, what happened with the dominance of dogmatism and the emergence of skepticism is that, and here I see the connection, is that finally another position emerges. The so-called latitudinarians or the indifferentists. That's Kunstler, not mine. There are not only skeptics, but also the called indifferentists that assume that even skepticism, because it negates dramatically all previous positions within metaphysics, <clears throat> and thereby just become, became another, another metaphysical position, um, that if that is, the, that is the insight that drives the indifferentists basically to say, we shouldn't care anymore. Right? We should be indifferent to these questions, to which we cannot, as reasonable beings, or as beings endowed with reason, remain indifferent. The indifferentist is what Kant calls, literally Kant first critique, the mother of all chaos and the night. Right? Indifferentism is the mother of all chaos and the night. The night of reason, obviously. There is before indifferentism the choice between two unconvincing unconvincing options. Either one form of uh, uh, not f never fully legitimate dogmatism or skepticism, which itself turns into another form of dogmatism because it dogmati dogmatically rejects any metaphysical option of dogmatism. Right? So there is no choice. It seems one can choose between metaphysics or skepticism or dogmatism and skepticism, but skepticism is just like the flip side of dogmatism and hence there is no choice. So from this stand, uh, dead end that is generated between, uh, from, f out of the bad, infinite structure of metaphysical dogmatism and the skepticism against it, there appears this new option. Either one opts for or against dogmatism, and anyway, <clears throat> uh, in, in a way or the other, one ends up in dogmatism, so there is no choice, or one refutes the choice between dogmatism and closeted dogmatism, that is skepticism, altogether. Right? This is what the indifferentist does. They reject the choice because the terms are very unconvincing and unsatisfying. The indifferentist rejects the choice by basically stating that both options are equally bad. As Stalin once said, right? No, thank you, both are worse. That's also the, the indifferentist speaking. Because there is no stable criterion and no normative framework, the indifferentist claims to oppose the ch uh, claims to oppose the choice offered by the former metaphysical setting and s pretends to stop caring. Yet, and this is now, now Kant's point, the crucial point is here that the indifferentist still decides not to decide. 
Right? It's not a complete abolishment or negation of decision, but it's a decision not to decide. This position makes it thinkable that there is more than what seemed thinkable before. Right? There is another layer of decision involved. The emergence of indifferentism is for Kant in this way very good news. He is very explicit about that. It's not that everything goes down the drain when the indifferentists appear, but this is the beginning of the age of criticism or of, of critique. Why? Because we see that the choices offered are not all that there is. This is what the indifferentist makes us aware of. So in a sense, democratic materialism is also good news. I'm suggesting that it's a form of indifferentism. Right? For the democratic materialist decide, decidedly states that there is nothing but bodies and languages, nothing but a conglomerate of formal materialism and idealism. But you emphasize this, that when materialism seems to be the only option, in a time where materialism internalizes, internalized uh, the classical definitions of idealism and materialism, it's high time to defend a new version of materialism, taking democratic uh, materialism more seriously than it takes itself. Why? Because the internalization, the recuperation, as Badiou calls it these days, is countered in Badiou by a different form of uh, materialism. The basic idea behind Badiou's revision of materialism, I think, is the following. Namely, that what one needs to exceed is the idea that the only thing there is, is what there is. That's, I think, Badiou's most profound maneuver, right? Never believe that all there is, is all there is. It's not all there is. That's the point. So, in a, in a certain sense, there's more than what there is. How can there be more than what there is, and if this is also what makes materialism and idealism coincide? But Hughes' answer is the following, I think. There can be something that forces you to think differently. Yet what forces you to think is not simply a given kind of matter, of being, or something like that. But what forces you to think is something that happens. He thereby inscribes another category. Right? This also means that there is nothing unless there is something happening. There is nothing unshakably given. That is to say that one only does think when there is something that forces one to think, to use that Deleuzian formulation. This is, I think, the, the grain of but use materialism. Yet what forces one to think is not something that is just given in the form of consciousness, nor in the form of being. Rather, it's something that happens to us. The, he always is very specific about this, saying uh, it's the emergence of a new possibility. Right? So it's not a possibility that's already there, but a, a possibility that is created, that is generated, and the advent of history. Such a happening, so to speak, that what you refers to as an event, opens up the stagnation of being and consciousness and introduces history within it. Yet, that which happens to us is not simply something objectively happening to us, but rather has a subjectivizing effect. It makes us into a subject. It interpolates us, in a way. One can here see a materialist rationalism and a rationalist kind of materialism. There is something happening than what, that, that one would not have deemed possible from a position uh, that endorses the primacy of consciousness or being. Um, so in a, in a sense, but you here moves to a materialism of practice. Thereby, against the contemporary form of materialism, but you's point is to retrieve something of idealism, I think. For if there can be something that happens to us, it has material consequences. It is effectively nothing but the consequences it has. Right? It's not, it doesn't have a substance of its own. But what it is, is what it will have been. I mean, this is all, always the logical framework. If one falls in love, this will lead to material effects. One ch changes one's life, moves together, watches movies, buys a dog, a car, whatever, right? I mean, very stupid example, but nonetheless, I mean, material consequences of just meeting someone. So there is what Michel Foucault once called the materialism of the incorporeal. Right? It materializes something that itself has no substance. A materialism not of being that determines consciousness, but of the event. With something happening to us, emerging from an event, there is a materialization of something that otherwise would have no material consistency. And this something, but you call it an idea. Say, 
the idea of what it means to be in love. But you suggest that in those moments an idea materializes and is verified through the unfolding of the consequences of an event that happens to us. The peculiar inversion of idealism and materialism that takes here place, I think, um, therefore, I think, should be called uh, idealism without idealism. Right? It, takes, it makes a plea for a material account of the idea and thus completely reverses what formerly was considered to be idealism. There can be an idea, but it's not given to us, but it is, in a sense, materially produced through the practices that follow something that happens to us. Here I'd like to move to the second category that plays a role in my title, namely to courage. Just like, why? Because but you over and over emphasizes that today the thing we need the most is courage. And so what is courage? It's astounding. One doesn't find good books on that question, actually. But, yeah. But you think courage is essentially involved in investigating the consequence of something that happens to us. That is a constitutive, subjective effect. So it's, it takes courage to be in love. That's, I mean, oh, sound like romantic, I'm sorry. But here I think it's important to note a few things, conceptually. <clears throat> And I want to start with the following, namely that Jacques Lacan uh, at one point asserted that Martin Heidegger was right. Heidegger famously claimed that anxiety does not have an object. Fear always comes with an object, an object in the world, right? You're afraid of a guy with a machete chasing you. I mean, that's a horror movie scenario. But anxiety doesn't have an object, that kind of object. Yet, and this is Lacan's specification, anxiety is not without an object. Not without, in French, is passant objet. The not without object is an indicating of a passing object. Quelque chose qui se passe. An object passant. Something happening. Something taking place. So anxiety is linked to something happening to us. In Heidegger, fear has an object and anxiety does not. Here it is important to assume that therefore courage Courage does also not have an object. Why? Because I want to argue its object, the object of courage, is always, is also a passing object, something that happens. If anxiety doesn't have an object, courage does neither. Alain Badiou has repeatedly claimed that courage is the most important affect these days. In the period of time in which courage ap appears solely in Hollywood movies, in a chauvinistic way, at least, one can argue that it is the symptom that courage is entirely absent from almost all contemporary philosophical but also political debates. So the question that then emerges is thus the following and simple one. How to conceive of how to think courage in that concatenation? What is the link between anxiety and courage? So the question is simple. What is courage? Because only when we answer this question, I think one can answer in how to specify the peculiar and particular subjectivizing effect that something that happens to us has on us. How does it look from the imminent perspective? What does it mean to be courageous? If it cannot be a virtue that we just have, right? I mean, it must be linked to something happening to us. Obviously, courage was an important thing to think about for a philosopher for a long time. But nowadays, courage was either moved to the back in the hierarchy of concept or it became, becomes increasingly more irrelevant. One may just simply ask, does it take courage? And if so, what kind of courage does it take to think philosophically and to reflect philosophically also on the concept or affect of courage? May one not assume that philosophy always thinks in cold blood? even if it gives a, gives a conceptual account of courage. But maybe, and this is the question I want to address, it is important maybe, even especially today, to emphasize that courage is not one thing among, amongst many that one can philosophically reflect on, but that it again, especially today, is of a crucial importance to rethink. As I indicated, courage never comes alone but it always seems to imply at least one more term, namely, namely anxiety. Courage, therefore, is something like the plus one, the supernumerary effect or concept, something that one adds, to use this expression in a provisional sense, to anxiety. It is a mode of dealing with it, a mode of handling it, or of putting it to work. 
It seems to me that as nice, as charming as courage might sound, and who would not in principle like to be courageous, anxiety has a very bad reputation today. And it has something, I think, to do, uh, this, this kind of reputation it has something to do with democratic materialism, this new form of materialism. To be anxious to feel anxiety means in the most general sense of the term that one encounters something, whatever that may be, and one has the sense that things or the world are not necessarily and unchangeably how they are right now. Anxiety is an affect, and as Lacan, uh, Lacan claimed, it is the only affect that never deceives, that comes with an insight into the non-necessity of the world and the way things are. Yet if you feel anxiety, anxious, and thus sense that there is no necessity why the world is how it is, say that it is not how it is because God made it this way, this has an effect on you. In one sense, that there is, uh, if one senses that there is no necessity of why the world is how it is, this can produce a certain sense, uh, in a certain sense, a profound dislocation. Things one assumed to be stable start to crumble. There is what one conceptually can describe as terror. Not terror in the sense in which one, uh, in, in which one uh, uh, uses the term these days, but there is something so shocking about this feeling of anxiety, at least in this picture, that one may feel radically disanchored, displaced, dislocated. It seems to me that it's not surprising that in a world which is filled with terror in the sense of nihilistic acts committed by those who are radically excluded from the world in which we live, and that appears, appears to us <clears throat> uh, that one likes to call the West, that those who are included by being excluded and, in a, uh, and are in a position where they have no option whatsoever to be a part of it, so in a world which is filled with terror, anxiety and its terrorizing effect cannot have a good standing. It's precisely that which one seeks desperately to get rid of by implementing security measures, increasing controls, and whatsoever. And in a way, this is entirely understandable, yet I think one way, one of the most fundamental maneuvers of seeking to ward off anxiety is by translating and transposing it into back into fear. It's a way of dealing with anxiety to transform it into fear, to ascribe an object to it. In this sense, Alain Badiou has spoken of a politics of fear which has become dominant today. Today there is a far-reaching recoding, translation, transposition, or maybe even recuperation of anxiety into fear, and, that th and this transposition of the one into the other has an effect on the contemporary status and understanding also of courage. Yet right now I just want to very quickly indicate what such translation and recoding of anxiety into fear entails, namely that something that as such does not have an object, anxiety, is turned into something that has an object. Anxiety is very literally objectified, furnished and equipped with an object, and precisely by objectifying anxiety, by inscribing an object into it, anxiety becomes fear. What kind of effects this objectification or maybe even commodification, has on courage and why today one seeks to ward off anxiety. This is the question I want to just like hint at uh, in the following. For it's not at all something extraordinary that the concept of courage appears in the midst of philosophy. Rather, just taking a quick glance at the modern history of philosophy, one can see that philosophers have often and frequently defined or tried to define courage. And one might even be tempted to assume, as Alain Badiou once did, and I think convincingly that all philosophy, in one way or the other, is determined by the definition of courage it gives. So that's, that was Badiou's claim, right? Um, so it's a fundamental term. To make this point more palpable, just think of the following different versions of what it means to be courageous. The modern philosopher par excellence, René Descartes, stated in his last published work, The Passions of the Soul, that only a form of courage can free us from indecision and indifferentism and hesitation and is thus constitutive of a proper usage of our own rational capa capacities, i.e. of thought as such. No thought without courage in the Immanuel Kant famously took the Enlightenment movement, a project to ultimately turn around the courage to use one's own understanding, sapere aude, which implies that without courage, we don't use our understanding, which is a difficult thing to understand, actually, right? We have it, but we don't use it, so we need courage to use what we have. So, yeah. 
After Kant, Hegel stated that, I quote, the courage of truth is the first condition of all philosophy. That is to say, without courage, one cannot do philosophy at all. But Hegel then also states, maybe astonishingly, that this courage also is, I quote, a courage of passivity, unquote, which entails that one releases oneself, entlassen in German, to be guided by the very peculiar object of thought and overcomes any two simple and problematic ideas of autonomies or independence, autonomy or independence. After Hegel, Kierkegaard once held courage as being, I quote, the only measure in life, which is, I think, quite nice because it might indicate right, that when there is no courage, there is no measure. And measure is actually, I think, quite a problem. So it's the only measure in life, that is to say, we do not know what a life is worth without acts of courage, in which we put at stake everything that we really care for and take a leap of faith, because only thereby we're able to measure what otherwise would remain unmeasurable. After Kierkegaard, Heidegger argued for the liberating effects of anxiety and spoke of the necessity of a, I quote, courage of anxiety, unquote, that is needed to overcome our immediate everyday beliefs, i.e. what one could call the spontaneous ideology of everyday life. And finally, and clearly, after Heidegger, but you make courage into the fundamental element of any process and practice in which one becomes a subject proper. What one can derive from this short and abbreviated list, which one can certain, certainly expand, is that the different characterizations of courage, all in one way or the other, are linked to the profound idea that one is vis-a-vis -vis courage oriented in one's life or existence. Courage is that which offers a kind of different orientation, one that enables one to overcome indifferent to use one's own thinking make, makes, makes one capable of giving oneself to a movement of thought, provides a new orienting measure, and thus has to do with what it means to become a subject. That is to say, something that's fundamentally oriented and directed towards something. If courage is another name for what it means to gain orientation, not to know what courage is implies not to know what it means to be oriented, or in short, to be fundamentally disoriented. Already at the very foundation of philosophy, namely in Plato, one can find an intricate reflection on courage. I will not here refer to his famous Republic, which in one way or the other is a long, very long dialogue on the need, the function, and the very understanding of courage, but I do here want to refer to another of his dialogues, which has the concept of courage as its guiding threat and main theme, namely his Laches. This very dialogue starts off with the question of how to properly educate one's children, because the two people starting the dialogue are looking for the right teacher for their respective children, and within this general framework of education, the category of courage occurs. Let me reformulate this. The question that the two looking for, uh, is, uh, looking for the right teacher for the children race is the following. How does one teach courage? This is the fundamental question. How do, do we make people into courageous people. Can courage be taught, and if so, by whom? Trying to answer this question, within the dialogue, one encounters the following elaboration of courage, offered by General, General Laches, after whom the dialogue is named. He explains courage by giving an example of a courageous act, and it's quite charming, actually. Courage, I quote, courage is when I see the enemy and run towards him to engage him in a fight. That's courage, right? That's General Laches speaking. Yet, Socrates states in his reply to this, it's a good example of courage, but an example is not a definition. So he's not fully satisfied. It's a good example because when one openly runs towards and thus affirmatively, uh, affirmatively confronts a dangerous situation, one does something that seems to demand courage. First, because a coward would not do so, and it shows that the courageous agent is not afraid, but also, secondly, because it shows that courage has a fundamental practical dimension. It is not simply a theoretical concept, but one that has a direct relationship to practice. Courage is always the courage of a certain kind of practice. It's a de depiction of it. But, and this is why Socrates is slightly unhappy with this example, starting from it, one can simply not generalize the situation such, such that one assumes that courageous acts are always acts in which one confronts an outer enemy, nor that courageous acts necessarily imply that one has to voluntarily enter into a life and death struggle with such an enemy. This example thus does not make it entirely clear and decipherable what courage is. 
This example tells us something about the courage of a soldier in a specific situation, but not of courage in general. General, general Lapis then replies, confirming Socrates' reservation that, for I fancy, I do not know the nature of courage, somehow or the other, it has slipped away from me, and I cannot get hold of it and tell its nature. Nearly at the end of uh, the dialogue, Socrates ultimately concludes, we have failed to discover what courage really is. So what Plato's dialogue on courage, the Lachus, offers is not a definition of courage, but an example of it. And it is important to note that at the very end of the, two, uh, of the dialogue, the two people looking for a teacher for their children decide that it is Socrates who should educate them. So we do not get a definition of courage, but we get two examples of courage. General Lachis, General Lachis' example of the courageous act, and Socrates' exemplary gesture, if one may say so, stating that, he, that they did not attain a definition of courage, yet this affirmation or, uh, qualifies him to be the best teacher of courage. Right? I mean, they were looking for, for a guy who can teach courage, and they, in the end, they decide it takes courage to claim we don't know what courage is. There seems to be, on both sides, an example of courage. On one side, there is an exemplary case of courage involved in the practice of radically raising the question of what courage is, that itself is, becomes manifest in the very practice of Socrates, one may say, in the practice of philosophy itself. And it implies that one can even courageously refuse all definitions and admit that one only knows of examples of courage, but not of the definition of it. And on the other, there is a clear and practical example of General Lachis. One could, just reading this dialogue of Plato and not referring to any other, infer from this that maybe there is precisely due to the practical dimension of courage never a definition of courage outside or apart from examples. Maybe there are only singular cases of courage, exemplary actions and deeds that do make a definition difficult if not impossible, yet that nonetheless there are they are not simply without any form of universality, because any example of whatever constitutes a universal class for which it itself stands, yet this class is constituted only by means of this example. And then a new example of courage reconstitutes this very class from another singular perspective and starting point of another singularity, yet although both are radically different, both singularities, both singular examples of courage, both contribute and are examples of the same universal class, namely of courage. That's the idea. You only find sing singular acts of courage that define the totality, the set of what courage is, but you cannot give a definition, right? And you revise and you, add, you supplement this very definition with n any new act of courage, uh, which thereby is not a singular case only, but has a universal dimension, determining itself what courage means. Although any example just gives us thereby a singular form of orientation with regard to this universality, and not to the universality as such, so because of the example of General Lachis, the soldier running toward his or her enemy, confronting him or her, offers a peculiar concatenation of singularity, it is just an example, and universality, it constitutes, constitutes a universal class to which maybe even Socrates' own practice then might belong. After Plato, the philosopher of definitions, the thinker of whom Elias Canetti once said that he has a compartment for whatever being or attribute he might encounter, Plato's pupil, Aristotle, seemed to do better than General Lachis and Socrates did, because he came up with a clear and refined definition of courage. In the ninth chapter of his Nicomachean Ethics, Aristotle deals with courage and defines it first of all as a virtue. And any virtue for Aristotle implies that there is a situation that, that it situates in the middle between two extremes, that it is what gives measure to the two extremes, and more specifically with regard to courage, Aristotle claims that courage stands, I quote, in the middle region of the effects between fear and confidence. Five? Around five. Um, so courage is here linked to fear, but also and additionally to confidence on the other extreme end. Courage moves in between what makes us afraid and our self-confidence, such, such that we do neither have too much confidence nor too much fear. 
But Aristotle then specifies that courage does not deal with all kinds of things that we fear, but rather is the name for dealing with, the very, specific, with very specific things we're afraid of. For there are certainly things that one cannot but fear, and it is rational to do so, yet it's not virtuous to confront them nonetheless with the right amount of courage. Things that make us ashamed in the eyes of others, for example, are things that we certainly fear, yet it makes no sense to confront them confidently, for committing shameful acts has nothing to do with virtue. And hence, this conf confident way of dealing with what one fears cannot be called courageous in all cases. What are then the things that courage deals with, the things one fears but has to confront with the right amount of confidence? Aristotle's first answer is death. Yet he immediately adds that not any kind of death is the peculiar object of courage. Rather, it must be one where the death is linked to the category of honor. And for Aristotle, this is paradig paradigmatically the case in the death that one confronts while fighting a war. As in the fighting example of General Lachis, here war is the paradigm of the courageous acts. Since the courageous person that for Aristotle is the male soldier, um, acts fearless and undaunted. Aristotle claims that, I quote, courageous is fearless as a human being, the courageous is as fearless as a human being has to be. But he will fear those things that exceed you in power, but in a rational way. What produces fear in a man can no differences, because what you fear must not be what I fear, such that Aristotle follows uh, that it's a matter of degree. But courageous is he who fears what he ought to fear and for the right reasons and not for some idiosyncrasies or individual pathologies and who is ready to confront what is in his power to overtake. The right measure of fear is thus crucial for the right amount of courage for only the Aristotle mad and dull do not fear anything and he who fears too much is a coward. The courageous person has the right amount of fear and confronts it with the right amount of confidence without being mad or dull and thus acts in absolute calm and this is an ethically good action. At the end of his reflection, Aristotle offers the typology of courage. There is civil courage, um, <clears throat> which is the motivation for virtue. There is courage that derives from experience and uh, a specific knowledge of situations and there is courage that derives from anger. Yet the latter tends to become boisterous, but it can help the courageous person to endure longer than he or she would otherwise. So civil courage plus experience and knowledge, if you add anger to, to it, is the most perfect version, the complete definition of courage for Aristotle. You have the right amount of confidence, you know the object that you're confronting, and with a tiny bit of anger, you can endure longer. The problem, and here I will end just like a very brief uh, reference, the problem that I see in Aristotle, and I think he is guilty of this, is he made courage into a militaristic category, a militaristic virtue in one way or the other. The paradigm is the struggle, right? the life and death struggle. Whereas in Plato, one still finds, namely paradigmatically in the practice of Socrates, another option of defining courage differently. Right? And I just want to end, and I hope you see why I'm still circling around the materialism question. I just want to end by pointing out one thing. There is a third definition of, not of courage, but of anxiety, one finds um, in the very beginning of Hegel's Science of Logic. Um, he states something absolutely ast astounding there, which usually is taken as a criticism, but I think it's meant as a praise. He says, critical philosophy was anxious with regard to the object. Hatte Angst vor dem Objekt. So Kant, right? Kant was anxious. And that's a praise. Why? Because Kant was the first philosopher for Hegel who ever was anxious. There was no anxiety in philosophy before Kant. Kant brought anxiety. Why? Because he saw that there is a different kind of object involved in thinking, something that happens, right? which has material influence. And the Kantian philosophy is the material incorporation of that kind of anxiety. Hegel thinks, and that, that's his claim, that one constantly and uh, constitutively needs to reread and revitalize this Kantian insight. One needs anxiety. The problem with Kant is he stopped there for Hegel. So what does one need to do? One needs the courage to be anxious, to read Kant, so to speak. Right? 
to then start working with it. And what that means, and I think this is one way, one way of defining, let's say, the, the imminent logic of this kind of practice I wanted, wanted to describe. Um, I leave the rest out. I hope this made any sense. Thank you.